Hello, this is Pastor Blake, and we're finishing up our study today of the book of Joshua with chapters 23 and 24. So all through Joshua, Joshua had to deal with a lot of things going on. Um, the people were becoming a nation at this point, the crossing of the Jordan, the conquering of the promised land, or at least most of it. There's still a little bit more work to do, even by the end of Joshua. However, the big majority of uh, what God had really commanded them to do was kind of completed. And Joshua is finally allowing the people to spread out and uh, go into the cities of, um, and, and possess their land, actually take control of their land and uh, try to get some farming done. Um, they also set up the cities of refuge. They set up the leadership. <clears throat> and so they really have um, a nation is starting to really be built as we see through Joshua. And uh, I encourage you uh, to keep reading on into Judges because some more of the work that kind of was not able to be completed by then uh, is continued after that. And so uh, we'll be doing that video series very quickly. But in Joshua uh, 23, we see that uh, in verses 1 through 3, it says, Joshua brought all of the people and reminded them of what the Lord had done for Israel. Now, just like we do uh, to our kids, to each other, we remind each other of certain standards that we have. Uh, that's why you have rules and stuff in, in the back lobbies and in, in the back uh, uh, restrooms of any business. You'll see the rules of how to conduct yourself. And, and you go into a restaurant and you see, hey, this is how you wash your hands. It's it's We as a people need rules to be in place and also to be reminded of those rules. For some reason, we cannot allow ourselves to just simply accept something and go on with it. We need to be refreshed. And, and this is kind of what Joshua was doing. He said, hey, you know what? This has been a long time. Lots of things have happened, lots of events. And so let's just remind Israel that, you know, what of all the Lord has really done for them. And so he goes on and he really talks about a little bit of Israel's past. And through the next few verses, he kind of goes back really from where Joseph started and to Moses and on and what they have been through so far. And so in verses four and five, it says, the Lord has allotted land for each tribe as an inheritance. There were still more nations to be driven out, but the Lord would be with them as they continued to possess their land. He's like, hey, you know what? All the things that uh, God has done uh, for us, well, you know what? He's done this as he's given you this land. He's given you a place to call your own. And in verses six and seven, it says, uh, through eight, sorry, six through eight, we see they were instructed to remain strong and faithful to the Lord. They were not to mix with these people because they could be persuaded to turn aside. And this is a verse we've really talked about almost in every video, just because it's the reason why they eventually did kind of turn aside. Uh, why you see them in Babylonian captivity and like Daniel and all the way through until really Christ comes uh, as the Messiah the very first time. And so we see that in verses six through eight. Therefore, be strong to keep all the things that was written in the book of law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. And so this really is, sums up the reasoning behind it. Now, some people uh, could use this as, well, this is the means the races shouldn't mix, but this is more than a race thing. This is not about races mixing or interracial anything. This is really about the people of God, okay, mixing with non-people of God. Now, as far as their homes and stuff, I mean, you would have to interact with them. They traded with some of them. They had some of them actually do labor in their own households. But we are to do that. Jesus actually reaffirms this idea in the New Testament when he says, uh, you shall be equally yoked. That's what he's talking about. You, If you are a believing Christian and you are dating someone who is not a believing Christian, you are not equally yoked. I'm sorry. That's all there is to it. He said, look, you will start mixing your thoughts and their thoughts thoughts and merging them together. I don't care what you feel, you need to serve the Lord. And he's saying exactly the reasons why he's actually telling them to do this. You shall not uh, mix with them. And, uh, and, it, and it says in verse 7, that you may not mix with these nations remain among you, or make mentions of their names, of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. Because he knew that when someone is trying to live for God, 
and then someone else is not trying to live for God, this person will have to compromise. You have to. You cannot just simply live your life for God and be a, a person, a vessel being used by God while your other person, your partner, is, is, is not living that way. Now, I mean, you know, there are certain situations, there's kind of exceptions to that rule sometimes, but this is not something to be encouraged. This is something to be warned against. Hey, you know what? If, if your spouse does come to know the Lord, that's great. And God can do that. However, uh, but whenever we involve ourselves in, in someone else with, especially in marriage and relationships like that, they can have us to turn away from the God, our Lord and Savior, because we have to compromise because this world is enemies of God. This world cannot live up to the expectation that God has for us, that God wants for us. We have to live a certain way. They live any way they want because they're the world. They're in sin. They can live any way they want. And so we have to understand this is not just for race separation or anything like that. That's, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about mixing with these people that do believe in the Lord and don't believe in the Lord. We are to keep, make sure that our intimate relationships, our deep relationships, our, our, our marriages and our relationships in that kind of way are to be with people that also have the similar, I love the Lord. We cannot mix with those. Now, on a daily basis, obviously, we mix with those all the time. We, uh, we have relationships and we can go out to eat with those people and we invite them into our home so that they can see how Christian relationships and people live. However, to mix uh, and to be equally yoked is a very important thing to God because you do see that when people are unequally yoked, one will strain and pull the other away. And so we cannot let that happen. It's a simple concept, but you do see it everywhere. I've seen it all growing up, people unequally yoked in relationships. And, and, and you wonder, why would you do this? But it's a principle that we have to continually, for some reason, be reminded of over and over again. And you know what? The Lord reminded us of it. And so we take heed to this. Uh, we don't, those intimate relationships like that, we do not unequally yoke ourselves with someone who is not of that same faith. It, it's just very, it's very dangerous. And he did this because he, he said, you know, it can pull you down. You, you're going to start swearing to this and you're going to start bowing down to this and you're going to start leaning this way. And the Lord God, he has his way and it's very separate from the Lord's ways, the world's ways. And we, we have to be sensitive to that. We have to know that God has everything under control. He has the best for us. He has the greatest plan. However, we also know that we have to stay focused. We have to stay with him. And so in verses 9 through 10, it says they shall stay faithful because they have seen what the Lord could do. God has allowed them to be powerful and mighty against anyone they fought against. I mean, the Lord really fought for them. You saw all of the battles, all of the times where, you know, uh, they were up against odds that were really against them. I mean, in every way they were against them. However, they were able to rise above it because they served a God who was fighting for them, who had a plan and who was making sure his plan was actually being finished, actually being completed. And so we see that. And verses 11 through 13, we see they needed to cling to the Lord. If they did not, if they married the other nations, Israel would be turned from God and God would no longer fight for them. He would let them be enslaved and perish. Verses 11 through 13. Let's read that a little bit more. It says, um, be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this ground good ground that the Lord your God has given you. And here's the thing. The bigger picture of the Bible we know in Daniel is in actual, um, uh, in actual uh, um, bondage and, and captivity. And we see Jeremiah, he's prophesying, look, this is all the stuff that was happening. We saw earlier that this is a part of the law that you don't really intermingle and you don't intermarry with people of not like faith. So you can, you, you should not do that. And Israel eventually did. Uh, they eventually did allow themselves to be manipulated and pulled away from God. And when they had pulled away to a certain point, God said, all right, I'm giving you up to the people 
in your area. I'm giving you up to the captains. And that is actually kind of where we see the Babylonian captivity. Uh, at, that is in the first part of Daniel. That's actually where it comes from, is from this idea that they did eventually let their guard down. They stopped serving God in the ways that he said to do. And uh, they allow themselves to be manipulated uh, by the kingdoms around them. And so we have to make sure that we do not allow stuff like that to happen to us. We know that the, you know, Satan is just waiting for an opportunity uh, to destroy your life. He really is. I mean, that, that is a true reality we all need to understand. And we need to understand that, that Satan does not care about us at all. He could care absolutely less. He does not care. Uh, he wants to destroy us any way he can. And hey, you know what? Uh, if it's relationship, if it's other things, if it's your own private life, if it's anger or, or resentment or envy, he will do anything he can because he does not like us. Uh, we have got an, we've gotten an opportunity to be redeemed and he does not. He cannot stand that. And so we must serve the Lord. And so in uh, 14, it says, Josh remains, uh, reminded them that everything the Lord said would happen as come to pass. He has kept up his end of the bargain. And that's a big thing to consider. And also for us to be encouraged about, because whenever we look at the Bible, we say, well, Lord, you know, you did this, you did that. God has always kept up his end of the bargain. But we are the people, we are the, the creation that has not done what God has asked us to. And so he will redeem us. He will keep us, uh, you know, uh, within his own plan. Yes, but there is so much more that God could do. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we kind of get in the way of it, honestly. Um, we, we get in the way of the possibilities. God's will will always be done. However, we do get in the way and we allow ourselves to say, well, you know, God, yes, he did that good thing, but I don't know about this time. I don't know about the next time. I don't know about the ha next hard thing. And so when the next hard thing comes up, we get discouraged. We Stay unfaithful to God. We, we don't remain uh, trusting in him. And unfortunately, that's a big thing that humans just kind of have problems with. And, um, and so, but he has kept up his in the bargain. We, all we have to do is his. If Israel did not turn from their, uh, from their ways, if they kept following God, the Babylonian captivity, I mean, it seems as though it would never have happened. Um, there would have been no need for it uh, because they were faithful. They were true to God. And so we see that uh, God does what he says he's going to do. And, you know, regardless of what we do, he's going to do his will. And so in verses 15, 16, it says, we, if they were uh, to abandon God, everything the Lord did for them and to their enemies would be reversed. Uh, kind of how we read in verses earlier. He would let their enemies prosper and let Israel lose. And that's exactly what they did eventually down the line. And, um, and so we, we see that as uh, a truth. You know, God keeps his end of the bargain. We have to keep ours. And in chapter 24, there's a little bit of a shift, just kind of the wrapping up of the, um, of the book. Um, big, kind of bigger ideas, really. Uh, verses 1, they could have been the same event. Uh, this, well, just as a general uh, statement, this could have been the same event as chapter 23. Um, he could have uh, made the statement to be more specific about the location, because in 23 it says, A long time after when the Lord had given the rest uh, to Israel from all of their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old, and then... 24 actually starts over, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders and the heads and judges, the um, officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before the Lord. Uh, we don't know if chapter 23 and 24 happened at the same time. However, it could be two different events. It could be the same. Uh, but he does give more specifics in the first verse. They're in Shechem right now. So in verse 2 through 5, it says, Josh reminded the people all that God had done for them through Abraham, all the way up to Moses being used to deliver them out of Egypt. And he kind of just does a, you know, kind of a, a skimming. Uh, Joshua said, all these people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. And he starts reminding them, Father Abraham, and the Father Abraham was beyond the river, and uh, he led them into the land of Canaan and made his offspring, um, offspring many, and I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country, and Jacob, and it goes down to, and his children went down to Egypt and I sent Moses and Aaron the plagues of Egypt with them and uh, so he, he just kind of reminded them hey this is all what God has done for you 
you got to remember this because when serving him, remember what he's done. Remember, he has been faithful. There is no reason to turn from God because he has been faithful. And in verses 6 through 13, it says, God had brought the people out of Egypt to the sea and helped them escape while destroying the Egyptian army. He brought Israel to the promised land and fought for them until they acquired the land and possessed it. So we do see he's con just continuing this story and this, uh, this plan showing them, look, I've done all of this for you. I've taken you over this. I've fought against the Amorites. I've fought against Balaam. We, we've done all this stuff and, and we've We've warred against the Amorites, the Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, the Girgashites, and the, the, the Hittites, and the Jebusites. We've, I've done all of this for you. And I'm showing you I'm with you. I'm showing you're my people, and I will love you, and I want you to be with me. I'm showing you all this. And then in 14 and 15 verses, it says, uh, Joshua challenged them to let go of anything from the past life that separated them from God and choose whom they would serve and stick with this powerful verses in verse 14 now therefore the fear of the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord and if it is evil in your sight eyes to serve the God choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites and whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so Joshua gives a powerful statement. Hey, look, if you don't like the God that led you out of Egypt and led your people and conquered all this, all the things that you've seen, if you don't like them, well, then serve the Amorite kings. Do it. Do it. Serve the Amorite God. See how that gets you. However, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's something we have to bring into our households. I mean, our kids, you know, your kid may not be wanting to go to church. Your kid may not be wanting to serve or to learn. But here's the thing. God has a special place for, you know, for, for, for his people. And there is another place that is not for his people. And that is hell. And there is a real place that we will one time, at some point, we will go either to heaven, either to hell. And God would love you to be with him. He does. He, he I mean, he died for your sins. However, uh, there is a real place. And we cannot allow ourselves to let our household just, well, you can figure it out as you go. No, we have to be proactive in leading our households, men's leading your wives and wives leading your children and parents leading your children and children learning and growing and maybe helping your parents. And we have to build each other up, especially into the house of the Lord. You know, the church as not a building, not the four walls, but a, a people made of many members, but one body. And we have to build each up. Look, we will serve the Lord. We will not go off and find these strange thoughts and these strange doctrines and, and start manipulating who Jesus is and who God is. But we will serve the Lord God that has showed himself to us, that has made himself known to all people. And so we have to, uh, we have to be proactive about that. We cannot allow ourselves just to, just to go and, um, and just to you know, just to, to be manipulated by Satan, because that's what he's going to do. That's what he wants to do. That's what he's trying to do. And, uh, but we will serve the Lord. And so uh, do that in your own household. You need to proclaim it to everyone. We will serve the Lord. And so in verse 16, 18, see the people proclaim that God was the only God and they would uh, be foolish to serve any other, which is true. However, the further generations go, the, the, the kind of the forgetting of all these things the Lord has done is exactly what happened. They forgot kind of what the Lord had done for their people. And that's why they kind of was starting to serve the other gods. And, but they said, look, we'd be foolish not to serve him. Look at all that he's done. Look, I mean, he has been faithful. He said what he would do and he did it. Why would we not be faithful? Well, eventually we know they did. However, uh, right now these people understood, you know, they have got to serve God. In verses 19 and 20, it says, Joshua warned them that the Lord God has warned them and they have proclaimed him. If they go back on their word, God will turn away from them. Kind of this reiteration, this last bit of chapter of, of uh, Joshua, he really just reiterates, reiterates exactly what's going to happen if they turn their backs from him. And 21 through 22, it says the people agreed and understood. And Joshua said, you are witnesses to yourselves. And verses 23 and 24, once again, put away the foreign gods and serve only him. And they agreed. In verses 25, 26, Joshua wrote in the book of the law of God and placed a large stone under the terebinth. 
In verses 27 and 28, it says, The stone was placed as a witness against the people to remind them of the covenant they made. And then he sent the people away. He said, you know, hey guys, I've, I've warned you. I've told you. We've talked about the law. You've seen what God's done. Hey, you're witnesses to yourselves. If you mess up, it is your fault. It is no one else's. And, you know, and this is one of the things that the generations down the line was able to say. Well, I mean, they did they did warn us. Because, hey, wonder if you wasn't warned. wonder if you just wasn't warned. Hey, you you you, you touch the burner on the oven, it's going to burn. It, you, you step off the curve wrong, you're going to fall. But wonder if you're like, I don't know, maybe just try it. Wonder if you wasn't warned. That's that's the thing. That part of what he he's reiterating here is also it lets me see. Hey, God even tells us exactly what's going to happen. He doesn't just leave us up to. Well, I don't know. Maybe God will save us. Maybe he won't. Maybe he'll just keep his word. Maybe he'll just kind of let it slide once. No, God keeps his word. And if we turn from him, he's like, hey, then you're gone. Then do whatever you want. Go for it. But my will, my path will be done. And if you turn from me. You're not going to be protected anymore. You're not going to be conquering anymore. You're not going to have your land anymore. You're going to go into captivity, which is eventually what Israel did farther down the line of history. And so, and then it kind of changes real quick. Um, it changes, gives us some last details about uh, their, their lives. Uh, in verses 29 through 30, it says Joshua died at 110 years old. The people buried him in his own town of his inheritance that we talked about in two, two videos ago, actually or one video ago, uh, he was given a city uh, for his uh, time spent as leader and stuff. And so he kind of, I guess, retired out and uh, he, he spent time and he died and they buried him in the city that he was given, 110 years old when he died. And uh, in verse 31, Israel and everyone who was alive during the time of Joshua or, um, or uh, of Joshua remembered him following the Lord. They remember, man, that was a great man of God. That was a guy that knew that the Lord was guiding him and let the Lord guide him and let him guide us. And so verse 32, it says, people buried their bones of Joseph in Shechem. Now, Joseph did ask them to do this. And so uh, you do see earlier in Joshua, they talk about this. Can't remember the reference, but they do talk about how they grabbed the bones of Joseph because he wanted to be buried in the promised land. And so this is them actually filling that. So in verses 33, Eleazar the priest died and was buried in Gibeah. Now, Eleazar, that, that was the, uh, the high priest with Joshua being the actual leader. And so, um, but, uh, but he died and was buried in Gibeah. So, Joshua is a fascinating book. I'm, I hope you uh, were inspired by this. I hope you enjoyed this study. Um, it's an amazing what he had to go through, but it's amazing because it really shows you a people group, what we talked about all the time, coming into a nation and really becoming a nation because this transition, we don't see that happening much. I mean, that's kind of, you know, every, every corner of the globe, it's kind of, you know, we know who owns it. We know who the people are. You know, we may discover new people, but, you know, if they're out in the middle of the jungle in Brazil, well, they're Brazilian. So it's it's kind of that kind of idea. Like, we don't have these unknown people groups anymore, really, that much. And But, but back in this time, everyone was unknown. All these people groups were kind of their own and coming up and figuring out who they were. And this is really the transition that we see from the people of Israel becoming a people, stepping across that Jordan and taking over the land that God had promised Abraham so many years before. Now it's actually coming to life. It's coming and it's becoming their truth instead of just a promise. It's now, it's really happening. And so as we see Joshua, uh, you know, uh, he was a great man of God and, and God really starts, you know, next is the judges uh, where he starts the people uh, that come up to protect his people, to guide them. And then he starts, you know, the kind of the prophets and then into the kings. And then at the end of it, we see the Babylonian captivity and then we see into the Medo-Persian Empire captivity and the Grecian Empire and the Roman Empire. We know that through history. And then Christ comes. And so we see that this is the beginning of a, a nation and a long history of God dealing with his people, but also showing us that he is always faithful. Be blessed.